Greetings from Tokyo. This is Daisuke Beppu, and I hope all of you are really doing well today. I have to beg your pardon again, but if you don't mind, I'd like to share with you some titles from the Criterion Collection that are currently out of print or OOP, and these are some titles that I really, really love. So yes, as I mentioned, these are titles from the Criterion Collection that are currently out of print, or OOP. Now this is a little bit of a, of a sad thing for me because I love the Criterion Collection and as you know, occasionally a title might fall out of print because Criterion loses the rights to, to produce and distribute those, those particular DVDs or Blu-rays. I mean, that's the nature of intellectual property. Um, however, it's nice to have these films at least floating around, you know, in the eBay world or the secondhand market, as it were. And if you can find them through the Criterion Collection, great. I believe that most of these are also available through other labels, so I'm not too familiar with the details of that. I apologize. But... If you're able to find them through other labels like Kino or Cohen Media or um, Studio Canal, etc., I highly recommend that you do. Um, of course, the Criterion version is uh, preferable from my standpoint, being a, an admirer of Criterion. But of course, the important thing is the film itself, is it not? So therefore, if you're able to find them through other channels or maybe online or streaming, for instance, then by all means, I highly suggest that you do. Of course, if you can find them in the theater, uh, you know, projected onto a big screen, that's probably the best option of all. Also, I'd like to say that this is not going to be a detailed review of each of the titles that I'm going to discuss. Uh, maybe one of these days I will try to devote a video to each of the titles in the Criterion Collection to give it more time. You know, I think just giving a title two minutes, uh, it, might, it doesn't give um, enough time to the film and it doesn't do the film justice. So I real, really feel bad about that. But, um, you know, uh, this is, again, just a brief overview of some titles that are OOP uh, that I really, really love. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's discuss them. Spy number 136, Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. This is a DVD that is currently out of print. And it's a real shame because this is one of my favorite Alfred Hitchcock films. It's the film with the famous dream sequence designed by Salvador Dali. It's the film starring Ingrid Bergman and Gregory Peck. It has a murder mystery element combined with uh, concepts about psychoanalysis. So it has a uh, maybe a little bit of an exotic flair to it. It's not a conventional murder mystery per se, although in the end, it, it ends up becoming one, which is not a bad thing. It's a real wonderful driving force to the narrative and to the, um, to the motor of suspense that Hitchcock employs. I love the chemistry between Ingrid Bergman and Gregory Peck. Uh, they have a real solid chemistry. I mean, it's not the greatest chemistry in the world, but it's really good. It's really good. There is a scene early on where um, uh, Gregory Peck who is uh, playing Dr. Edwards, right? And he is sort of romancing Dr. Constance Peterson, the Ingrid Bergman character, and they're out in a field somewhere near their hospital, and they're going to have lunch. And uh, so Gregory Peck pulls out a piece of paper or a note or something, and he says, so he's going to ask her about what is what does she want to have for lunch and it was a great it's a great question that he asks and it's one that I think is so illuminative of the human condition and the question is this 
ham or liverwurst? Gosh, I love that question. <laughs> I really love that question. And Ingrid Bergman's response is wonderful. Liverwurst. Anyway, here's hoping that the Criterion Collection one day brings this film back to the collection in all of its glory. Oh gosh, Spellbound by Alfred Hitchcock, spine number 136. Spine number 28, Blood for Dracula. This is the film directed by Paul Morrissey. And this is from, oh gosh, what year is this from? 1974, yes. And this is the film, the wonderfully bloody horror film filled with lots of sex and nudity and violence and blood and guts. Absolutely hilarious film. Uh, of course, the, the performance by Udo Kier as Dracula is fantastic. He steals the show. He is at once grouchy and funny and really menacing and kind of pathetic too. It's a real fascinating depiction of the Dracula character. Really wonderful film. Um, I must admit that it's, yeah, this is a real <laughs> favorite of mine actually. Um, I love the, the intense combination of real sort of um, uh, you know, really graphic uh, uh, sex scenes, you know. I think it's pretty soft core porn, uh, which is fine with me. And the violence and the blood and guts and the special effects are really just, um, they just come out of nowhere and just uh, really, it like hits you over the head like a sledgehammer. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And it's really funny too. There are some great lines here. Um, uh, yes, I love the way the characters say the word whore. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> anyway, um, and also um, uh, I should say that uh, the beautiful Stefania Cassini, uh, I love you, Stefania Cassini, if you're watching this, fingers crossed. But uh, anyway, I'm a big fan of Stefania Cassini, and she brings a very uh, interesting and uh, sensitive performance uh, in as one of the sisters really really great um, anyway blood for Dracula this is uh, one of two Paul Morrissey films the other being flesh for Frankenstein which is also out of print I like that film very much but I really have to give props to blood for Dracula here I think this is the one that uh, I really hold on to and it, it has a nice uh, clarity of plot and yet it is really focused with respect to its satire and its, yeah, its blood and guts and sex and nudity. It's really fantastic. Okay. Blood for Dracula. Spine number 488. Howard's End. This is the film from 1992, directed by James Ivory, produced by Ismail Merchant. So it's a merchant ivory film. This stars Emma Thompson as Margaret Schlegel and also Helena Bottom Carter as the sister Helen. And you have Anthony Hopkins as Henry Wilcox. Really, really wonderful film. This is one of my favorite films actually. Um, this happens to be the Blu-ray and I, you'll notice that I haven't broken it out of its seal yet because I don't need to as I have the DVD, which is also a Criterion release. And this is also, unfortunately, out of print. This is a Criterion release. It's not a spine number, but it's, it's, um, it's part of the Criterion Collection Merchant Ivory line that was released uh, some years back. But as I say, this is out of print. What can I say about this film? Um, this film is so deceptive, isn't it? Because you look at the the back of the box, you know, you read the, the, the label on the tin, as it were, and you think to yourself, this is going to be a stuffy uh, English historical drama. And on one hand, it is. It is a stuffy 
English historical drama in the sense that you have characters that are conversing in these sort of historical settings, these English cottages, these um, uh, you know uh, historical set pieces in London, as it were, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's fine as a sort of um, uh, a lovely veneer, but you pierce the veil and you realize that each of the characters that we run across in this narrative, each is so real and so human and so relatable. It's absolutely astounding to me. Each relationship, too, between the various characters is so human and understandable and complex and complicated. You know, it's not a situation where one always sides with one character over the other. You know, sometimes I side with the Emma Thompson character and other times I don't side with her. And that's a really difficult dynamic to maintain in a film. And I think this film does so well in maintaining that dynamic and then some. And then there comes a point when the drama is upped to 11, as it were, and it reaches a sort of crescendo of a climax that is just heart-stopping and tragic and <sighs> brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And you see all the characters react, and it's really wonderful. And I have to give special props to Emma Thompson and Anthony Hopkins. You know, their screen dynamic is electric, really electric. So many favorite scenes in this um, but perhaps one of my favorites is when Henry, played by Anthony Hopkins, is showing Margaret around a house, and he's on top. He's at the top of the stairs, and she's sort of uh, descending and t uh, approaching the bottom of the stairs. And it's this distance you have between these characters, this physical distance that exists. And it is at this moment that Henry Wilcox decides to propose marriage to Margaret Schlegel. It's a fascinating proposal scene. I, I don't think I've ever seen a scene quite like it. Um, but it, that's just uh, an example of how perfect, perfect the tone is of this film, Howard's End. Oh, and I'll just, it's so lovely. I mean, I don't want to go into specifics lest I spoil it, but just little things like the way that Anthony Hopkins' hair it, a little a little sliver of his hair is disheveled just a little bit and that's enough to show you the torment that is occurring within that character's heart and you know what I'm talking about if you if you've seen the film because some very um, uh, dramatic moments uh, do occur in this film this is a delight one of my favorite films the Ian Forster book upon which this film is based is a masterpiece I think I must have read that book gosh I must have read that book over 10 times by now. It, it, that's a real fun book, and it's so, so wonderful, and such an easy read, and it's deceptively, it looks so easy. This film seems so easy on the surface, but it is so complex and rich. Man, what I wouldn't give to, to see Criterion re-release this uh, into the collection. I know it's available through other channels, so don't let the fact that this is OOP and Criterion stop you from watching this film if you haven't seen it already. Anyway, Howard's End, a really delightful, delightful film. Spine number 316, Akira Kurosawa's Ron. This is from 1985, and I struggle in my mind as to which Kurosawa film I love more, Ron or Yojimbo. And at the moment, I must say my, hmm, I was going to say actually my, my heart says Yojimbo and my head says Ron. <laughs> but now that I think about it, I think my head says Ron and my heart also says Ron. <laughs> because this is just a masterpiece. This has everything you want. Everything you want. This is the ultimate expression of Kurosawa at his peak. He is a master and you realize that he is a master. It's almost as though Kurosawa controls nature itself. It's unbelievable. And you have the performances by, uh, not least of which by uh, Tatsuya Nakadai as the aging warlord Hidetora. And it's a real difficult performance, too, because uh, it, 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 there's a 
kind of a physical demand to it, which I think is, it's not immediately present upon watching it, but you can tell that every muscle in his body is being used, even to the, the most minute muscles in his face. Uh, Tatsuya Nakadai's performance is groundbreaking. It, it's, it's wonderful. It's absolutely astounding. But for me, I think the... Oh, before I get to that, um, of course, there is a just a wonderful sense of richness and a beautiful Japanese tapestry feel and the approach to the battle scenes, the scenes of war. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. It's really a, a, a violent, poetic expression. It's wonderful. This is a wonderful film. My favorite bit, my favorite part of this film, though, has to go to the performance of the great actress Mieko Harada. Again, that's Mieko Harada. So she plays the character of Lady Kaede. Now, Lady Kaede is perhaps one of, if not the greatest villain in all of Kurosawa's oeuvre, I think. She is just, when she's on the screen, my eyes cannot leave. It's just so mesmerizing. And one of the great things about this, uh, this DVD from Criterion is that it has a commentary by the Kurosawa scholar, Mr. Stephen Prince. And Stephen Prince makes some really great comments about Mieko Harada's performance. You know, he was commenting about how she has, she has a real quickness of her physicality, a real quickness. She's able to turn emotions on a dime. And it's really fascinating. And Stephen Prince was saying that, you know, it's really reminiscent of how Toshiro Mufune was able to really act and react with his body and his physical motion in a way that was electric and super fast. And it was really, um, it was really appropriate and cinematic and uh, just full of energy. So Mieko Harada's performance here um, as the great villainess is just truly, truly magnificent. And you just see, you just can see her thinking. And she's just so ahead of all these other guys in the group. Most of them are really stupid. They don't know what's going on, except for one guy. There's one guy, the uh, uh, Kurogane. Um, you know, he, he's suspicious of Lady Kaede, but she ultimately gets the better of Kurogane because uh, she has Jiro. Lord Jiro under her control, and that's the most important thing in order to uh, uh, to fulfill her plans uh, for the uh, Ichimonji clan, which is a real, <laughs> just wonderful, wonderful performance. There's a bit where Miyako Harada does a little thing with something that's wrapped in some cloth and some salt, and she has to be really perfect with her timing because the thing that's in the cloth has to do a certain motion in order to satisfy the needs of Kurosawa. And it's a real fascinating thing, the way she's able to, to perform that flourish. Um, I don't want to, I'm sorry that I'm speaking in very vague terms because I don't want to spoil it for those who haven't seen it. But again, Mieko Harada in this film is the highlight. She is amazing. She is probably, yes, she is the best villainess, best villain in all of Kurosawa's oeuvre by far. Ron, 316. My goodness, what I would not give to have Criterion return this to the Criterion collection. Hmm, I don't know if it's possible, but you know, one can only hope, I suppose. Spy number 64, The Third Man. So this is the film by Carol Reed, 1949, starring Joseph Cotton and Orson Welles. This is the Blu-ray. I also have another Blu-ray, which is the Digipack release. Um, so this is considered, I think, the, um, the Mount Everest of Criterion Collection, OOP collecting, as it were. This goes for really high prices on eBay and the like. Um, 
it's not necessary to get the Criterion Collection version necessarily because this is also available through other labels. So it's not like one cannot see the film. That being said, it is a fascinating, fascinating film, is it not? Um, it's so famous, I don't think I can add anything more to the conversation. Uh, but if I were to endeavor to do so, what would I say? It would be, right, of course, Orson Welles, the Zither music, the wonderful uh, cinematography, etc. But my heart, my heart goes to Joseph Cotton. Joseph Cotton's performance as Holly Martins is really wonderful. Um, he is so he he is at once very um, endearing and energetic and stupid at the same time. He's so stupid about women, for example, and he is a little bit clouded in his judgment. So he's a very flawed protagonist. But amongst that, amongst those flaws, we really love him, or at least I do. And I'm really concerned about his well-being as the film progresses because it is a real sinister world that Holly Martins finds himself in at the start of the film and as the film progresses to its wonderful, suspenseful climax. The third man is just just a jewel. It is an absolute jewel. And gosh, if this were to come back to the Criterion Collection, that would be a glorious day indeed. It would be a day of celebration. It would be just a wonderful thing. Gosh, gosh, criterion, criterion, criterion. <laughs> you know, you've surprised me in the past, so I know you are capable of even more surprises. So could the third man returning be yet another surprise that's uh, in the, her you know, in the foreseeable future, as it were? One can keep one's fingers crossed, I suppose. Anyway, the third man, spine number 64. Spine number 453, Chungking Express, Wong Kar Wai, 1994. This is the Blu-ray, and as you can see, this is also a Blu-ray that I do not have yet out of its wrapping, and that's because I have another one right here, which is the Digipack release. I remember I saw this film for the first time you know, when I was a student in college and to be perfectly frank I, I didn't like the film at all. I thought it was just meandering and pointless and I didn't see the worth in uh, following the protagonists you know, in each of the stories that's depicted in this film. I thought it was a bit um, lazy and I thought it was real amateurish. Fast forward to several years later, and I put this in the uh, Blu-ray player again, and I watch it, and I am blown away, and I am humbled at the fact that I thought so lowly of the film so many years ago, because now I think it is an undeniable masterpiece. It is just the perfect depiction, I don't know, of, of that kind of... It's not youth necessarily, but it's that sort of odd 20-something, maybe 30-something feel of uncertainty and just, um, uh, you know, carefreeness. Is that a word? <laughs> to be carefree, as it were, on the one hand, and yet to be uncertain about one's future on the other hand. And... You know, this is this is translated into uncertainty about one's relationships, you know, with the opposite sex, as it were, or in terms of love and friendship. And it's so, how should I put it? it it's so colored in these sort of poppy colors and uh, pop tunes and sounds and with these beautiful actors and actresses. And yet you realize that there's something more profound going on here. And, and you realize that there is something really um, uncertain about the human relations that are being depicted here. You know, there's a real sense of distrust and a lack of trust. Um, and, you know, you re maybe up to the end, you don't know how, <laughs> how hopeful this film is. You know, and, and even the relationships of love are handled in a really kind of creepy way, you know. Um, 
I mean, I love Faye Wong. I really do. Uh, she's beautiful in this film, but you have to admit that her character is a little bit creepy, you know, what she does. Um, but I guess that's part of the charm, really. And I just can't explain it except to say that there is, at, on the one hand, a real irreverent uh, excitement, and on the other hand, there is a kind of a grave, um, maybe foreboding, um, uh, uncertainty about the future. And I think that's such a wonderful combination. You know, it, it's, 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 it's complex in the way it leaves you kind of hanging there at the end. You're not happy, but you're not altogether sad or morose either, you know? And that's the sort of richness that I really admire about Chungking Express, you know? And that's the sort of thing that I missed when I was, uh, when I watched this as a younger, uh, you know, younger version of myself watching this. I didn't get it at the time. But I'd like to say that perhaps now I'm a little bit closer to getting it. And uh, yes, would this, were this to come back to the Criterion Collection, I would be so happy so happy to see this Chungking Express. My goodness, my goodness. This is also something that is very expensive, um, which is a shame because it really should be seen by as many people as possible. Anyway, here's hoping that Chungking Express returns to the Criterion Collection. So I'd like to stop there. Um, as you may know, there are a number of other titles that are currently Criterion Collection OOP, but uh, if I were to focus on all of them, that would just be very long. Maybe I'll focus on them in another video, um, and hopefully uh, alongside that I'll be able to provide maybe more videos that are focusing on single titles, because I, I really feel like, on the one hand, I, I love talking about these films, but on the other hand, I feel like I could go on for ages on a single film. So, um, um, uh, so yes, so anyway, let me stop there, and as always, I want to ask you for any comments or questions that you may have about these Criterion Collection titles or any other OOP titles that you think are worthy of mention. And I know that there are many out there that are indeed are worthy of mention. Yeah, I think that's it. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you again very soon. Take care.